Well, we're studying the admonitions to prayer. We want to continue that this evening. We're going to be looking tonight at, first of all, Matthew 21, 22, which is a familiar passage to all of us, but we'll be dealing with the question of prayer that changes things. Prayer that changes things. Matthew 21, 22, all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. Now, we've all heard the expression, I'm sure, that prayer changes things, but actually this is not what the Bible teaches concerning the prayer that God will answer. In Matthew 21, 22, he tells us that it's a prayer of faith that will change things, not mere prayer. Now, we already know that, but what we have to see is that it has to be the prayer of faith, and sometimes we think we're praying the prayer of faith, maybe when we're not. I say we because we're including everyone. So prayer will change things when it's made in faith. And the reason the prayer of faith will change things is because God will change things when you pray the prayer of faith. Now, what we mean by changing things is that God will change your condition for the better. Sickness to health and poverty to prosperity, defeat to victory, things of this nature. And the prayer that will change things is prayer that's made according to the will of God. It's prayer that is made in faith. It's prayer that stems from a right attitude toward God and toward your fellow man. It's prayer that is based upon the right motives. What we're saying here, there are many conditions in the Word of God besides just saying, well, I'm going to believe when I pray and believe I have received, Matthew 21, 22. 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says we must make prayer according to the will of God. He says, we have this confidence. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We know if he hears us, we have the petitions we desire. Now, there's no way God's going to answer your prayer unless it's made according to his will. And then we must base our prayer upon right motives because in James 4 and verse 3, we read that sometimes a person prays and doesn't receive an answer because they ask amiss, James says just to consume it on your own lusts. And then we said prayer must be made in faith. That's Mark eleven twenty four. When you pray, believe you have received. We said prayer must stem from a right attitude toward God and your neighbor. In 1 John 3, verses 21 and 22, we read that whatever we ask of God, he gives us because we keep his commandments and do those things which please him. Then in Mark 11, 25 and 26, we read that if we're going to pray the prayer of faith, we must have the right attitude toward our brother and sister. If we have ought against them, we are to forgive them. Now we say all of this by way of introduction to show you that the reason we stress there are no exceptions to the promises of God and there are conditions is because there are no exceptions to the conditions. You see, you can't take a general faith principle like John 14, 14, where Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. You can't take a general faith principle or promise like that and then ask anything you want in his name, anything you desire, without reference to all that he said in his word. That is, if you ignore the other conditions, then John 14, 14 doesn't work, even though it's an absolute faith principle. He said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. But that isn't anything that's contrary to what he's already revealed in his word as his conditions. For example, a woman said to me, she had prayed about a certain thing, believes in the prayer of faith, and believes she had received after she prayed. But she said, I still don't have the answer and don't understand why. As I questioned her and talked to her, she revealed that she had a critical spirit toward others. As I talked to her about this, she said, well, do you suppose God wants me to deal with this critical spirit I have before he answers my prayer? I said, obviously. I mean, why would you have to be told that there are conditions for God hearing you? And the answer to that was Mark 11, 25, and 26. If you have ought against your brother, forgive, or God will not forgive you. If he hasn't forgiven you, I don't think he's going to be answering your prayers. And then another woman said, well, I've prayed for healing. I don't have it yet. I don't know why. It isn't manifested, and it's been a long time. And why don't I have it? I said, well, the reason is you haven't accepted it. You haven't met the condition of Mark eleven twenty four. That is, when you pray, believe you have received. God cannot answer your prayer as long as you're asking him questions. When are you going to answer my prayer? 
because he answers your prayer the moment you pray, Mark 11, 24. If you've met the conditions, if you believe it. When you pray, believe you have received. Now we're talking about prayer that changes things. We want to see changes in our lives for the better. So what will prayer change? It'll change anything and everything that is contrary to your welfare as a child of God. The prayer of faith will change anything and everything that's contrary to the will of God for you as a child of God. What will the prayer of faith change? It'll change everything that is not for your good, Romans 8, 28. Now, you can take just one promise, Matthew 6, 33, where we read that if you meet the condition, God will provide for your material needs. He's concerned about your welfare there. He said if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that's the condition, then he promises to take care of your needs materially. He said, I'll supply all of your needs, all your material needs. So the prayer of faith will apply to anything that's contrary to your well-being, whether it's material or spiritual or mental, marital, whatever. Now, in order for us to get to the place where we can pray prayers that will change things for the better for our welfare, most of us, not some of us, most of us, will have to change the way we pray. Now, that's true of people who have been sitting in faith assembly for a number of years, too. Now, that doesn't mean you can't pray sometimes and get answers, and doesn't mean that I'm demeaning your knowledge of the Word or anything else, but what I'm saying is, if you want to get to the place that God always hears and answers your prayers, you'll have to get to the place where you change the way you're praying many times. To change the way you're praying, you have to change a lot of the notions and ideas you picked up from institutional religion. And if you didn't come out of that background, you've got a little advantage, but most of us did, so there are a lot of erroneous conceptions, a lot of misconceptions, that's what we dealt with in the last message on prayer, that every one of you, almost without exception, have been taught, even though you may know better, yet in a time of crisis or need, those things began to float up in your consciousness and hinder the exercise or release of your faith. Like the popular notion that we dealt with last time is that prayer is really a means by which you change your will into God's will. Sounds pious, but it isn't Bible. And we should always pray, not my will, but thine be done. Well, there isn't a word in the Bible that tells you to pray that way about the promises of God. Certainly, we want the will of God to be done. And if you were here two weeks ago, you heard us say over and over that you should know the will of God and pray according to his will. You certainly should. But you shouldn't be doing that after you pray or while you pray. You should be learning his will before you pray. Then you can pray according to his will. And not my will but thine be done has nothing to do with the promises of God. That's a pious excuse for your doubt and lack of faith. Not my will but thine be done means, should mean, at least you want to know God's will so you can do it, so you can pray according to his will. So you should be saying that before you pray. Now we're talking about the promises. When you don't know his will, of course, even then you shouldn't always be saying, not my will but thine be done, like... Your will is contrary to God's. If you ever say that, you should mean by that, Lord, I want to know what your will is, so my will will be your will. Yes, you should pray with the attitude that God's will be done. And if you do God's will, when you pray, you'll spend the time to get into his word to find out what his will is, and then you can pray according to his will. You're not praying according to God's will by saying, not my will but thine be done. You are pleasing God and praying in his will when you spend the time in his word to put 1 John 5, 14 into practice, if you ask anything according to his will, you know he hears you, and if he hears you, you have the petition you desire. I want to come tonight to another popular misconception that we, you, all of us, almost without exception, have to get rid of before you can pray the prayer of faith as you should. Now again, I'm emphasizing the fact that I realize we're in a faith context. This is called faith assembly, and some people have the tendency to kind of relax on you when you announce another message on prayer of faith. But don't do that because you're the ones we have to help or you're holding back the growth of the body because you're not maturing in the faith. We have to help you in time of needs, what I meant. So here's another popular misconception 
that may be down in the depths of your being that you have to get delivered from, and that is the erroneous notion that God always answers prayer, the prayer of his children. Now, there's nothing in the Word of God that teaches that. There's nothing farther than the truth. In fact, the Word of God contradicts that. God does not always answer prayer. He probably doesn't answer more than he does. Now, this view has gradually become popular in Christian circles as sort of a spiritual therapy to soothe the minds of Christians who discover sooner or later after they get saved that they just plain don't get any answers most of the time to their prayers. And so to keep them from giving up the idea of prayer altogether, the leaders have developed a new theology about prayer. It's not in the Bible, but they develop it to keep people from giving up prayer and to excuse their own lack of faith. This new theology is this. God always answers prayer. He has three ways to answer prayer. He says yes or no or gives a substitute. And generally, it's either no or substitute. Generally, it's not yes. God always answers prayer. He has three ways to do it. He can say yes to you or no to you or send a substitute. Now we're talking, keep in mind, about the promises of God. Now it doesn't matter that this view has no basis in the Bible at all. It doesn't matter that God didn't say this, and you'd search in vain to find that in the Word, yet it did, for the most part, put to rest that nagging question, why don't I get answers to my prayers? Why is it that the promises of God are not valid for today? Because in the Bible, they get answers to their prayers. Why don't I? And so by teaching that God always answers prayer, saying yes or no, or sending a substitute, the minister is no longer asked those embarrassing questions by his congregation. Why don't I get an answer? Why is it you teach on prayer, but when you get done, I don't know any more than before you started? I read a book today. It was not a big book. I just read through it, and you know no more when you get done than when you start by a non-charismatic on prayer. He just contradicted himself on every page. So by teaching that God always answers prayer, it does relieve the minister of answering those embarrassing questions, and it relieves the church members of having to face the question, why am I not getting any positive answers? It lets them save face when they don't get answers. They can say, well, he answered, he said no. Our son a substitute. As A.W. Tozier said, this allows such individuals to take God's refusal to answer as the answer. They say, he answered, he said no. God just plain doesn't answer you when you don't make prayer according to his will. He doesn't answer. That's a refusal to answer. But as long as you believe somewhere down in your depths, and every one of you came out of institutional Christianity, heard it. In fact, I taught it many years ago because you had to explain why you didn't get answers. Used all sorts of illustrations that weren't in the Word of God to prove it, to try to prove it. You see, as long as you can tell yourself God said no, then that kind of relieves you. It's a spiritual therapy, and you can save face, and you can blame God if you don't get an answer. The God always answers prayer theory leaves the disobedient, faithless Christian unchallenged. You see, you're not challenged to find out why God's refusing to answer you. You're not challenged to find out why you're not getting answers. If you think a no is an answer, or a substitute's an answer. You're not challenged to find out, is it my disobedience? Is it my lack of faith? Is it my sin? What is it? So as Tozier said, such an individual takes the refusal of God to answer as the answer itself. You see, this bad theology you pick up in institutional Christianity allows the faithless, sinning, carnal Christian to avoid the implication of why he isn't getting answers. And the implication is he's at fault. So he turns the whole thing around, blames God, says, well, yeah. he said no, yeah. or it isn't his will, or whatever. The truth of the matter is God always answers the prayer of faith when it's made according to his will because he pledges himself to do this. We have his word for it. God always answers prayer when it's made according to his will. 1 John 5, 14 and 15, if we ask anything according to his will, now that's anything, but it must be according to his will, he hears us. We know that if he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know we have, past tense, have the petition we desired of him. God always answers prayer that meets the conditions, meets his terms. But that's the only time 
He never, ever answers prayer not in harmony with his will. That would be an utter contradiction. He'll never answer a prayer of a person whose life doesn't measure up to what he requires of him, that doesn't line up with his word. If your prayer does not line up with the word of God, he's not going to answer it. John 15, 7, Jesus said, If you abide in me and my word abides in you, then you can ask whatever you will to be done for you. See, it has to be in line with his word. His word has to be abiding in you. In 1 John 3, 21 and 22, as we've already said, God says that we can have this confidence that whatever we ask, we receive from him. Whatever we ask. You ought to read it. 1 John 3, 21, 22. Whatever we ask, we receive because we keep his word and do those things that are pleasing to him. Yep. Now, if you don't meet those tests, then, of course, you can't pray the prayer of faith. You can talk about the prayer of faith. But see, God doesn't say no. He flatly refuses to answer prayer that's not in harmony with his will. But this doesn't mean anything to most Christians because they've been taught he always answers prayer. Yes, no, or maybe. Well, a no or substitute, these are no answers to prayer. A no is not an answer, that's a refusal. A substitute's not an answer, that's a substitute. What if you sent your child to the store for a gallon of milk to put on your oatmeal and the grocer sent Pepsi Cola? You'd never get that oatmeal to taste right in a thousand years. But if you followed the logic you do in church, and most Christians do, then you would say, well, he knows best. I thought I wanted milk, but he's a grocer. That's his business. I'm not a grocer. I'm just a housewife. They say, you know, God knows best his wisdom. I claimed this new car, and somebody offered me a 12-year-old rattle trap. He sent a substitute. That's his answer, because he probably knew I'd be proud or pick up girls or whatever. <laughs> oh, you hear all of these... Weird excuses, substitutes. Would you say the grocer knows best? Oh, he's got more wisdom about groceries than I have. He ought to know what's best for oatmeal. What if you ordered a new Chevy, four-door sedan, blue, white sidewall, tires, hard top, the whole bit, and you ordered it, he promised you faithfully, like God promises, and we're told he doesn't always do what he says? And they didn't send you the car, didn't give you the car. Would you say, praise God? I didn't get it, but that dealer knows best. That's his business. He's got more wisdom about cars than I have. And you'd say, but you don't have a car. You didn't get an answer. Oh, yes, I did. He said no. <laughs> That's the same logic you get from the pulpits week after week. Or if you ordered a new Chevy and he sent you a bicycle <laughs> as a substitute. Oh, I'll tell you, friends. You know, just a little common sense. You would think God had never said anything intelligible on the subject of prayer to listen to the way most people teach and write and pray. Have you ever heard what Jesus said? Turn over to Luke chapter 11, verses 9 to 13. God plainly tells you here. The Lord Jesus himself tells you he does not say no if you meet the conditions, and he does not give substitutes contrary to man's teaching. Luke 11, 9 to 13. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth. Now to me, he says, if we ask, and of course that implies meeting conditions, then he doesn't say no. Everyone that asketh receiveth. He doesn't say if it's my will. That is his will. He just revealed it. Then notice he doesn't send substitutes. Verse 11, If a son shall ask bread of any of you that's a father, would he give him a stone? What if your child asks for bread? And you start putting pebbles and stones, sand on the plate. Jesus said you wouldn't do that. Well, he said, Why, if you ask for healing, do you think I give you the grace to bear it? <laughs> or if you ask for the mortgage to be paid off because you're going to go all the way in faith and trust me for your finances, Romans 13, 8, that I won't do it because if you own that home, it might make you proud or you'll sin. You might throw a party sometime. If a son shall ask bread, will you give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will you offer him a scorpion? 
If ye then, being evil, would not do that, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Matthew, recording the same thing, says, how much more will your heavenly Father give good things to them that ask him for good things? Where do you find any substitute there? You'd have to go to church to find the substitute. Anybody want to show us a substitute there? Anyone want to show us any grounds for the teaching that's so popular in the commentaries and the books on prayer and the churches? All the churches, including charismatics, if you please, most of them, if you please, still think God says yes, no, or sends a substitute. Where do you find a substitute there? God gives a precise thing you ask for when you meet the conditions. That's an answer. If he doesn't give a precise thing, it is an answer. It's a substitute, and a substitute's a substitute. It isn't an answer. And a no isn't an answer. That's a refusal. How can it be an answer? The answer is getting what you ask for. If I make you a promise and then say, no, I didn't answer you if you asked for it. I refused. That isn't an answer. But if you think that's an answer, then you can say, well, praise God, I'm getting answers to all my prayers, but most of them are no. I really learned how to pray effectively. I get an answer every time. God doesn't give substitutes. That's what Luke 11 says. I was talking to a mother on the phone some time ago. She's charismatic. Her husband's a medical doctor and non-charismatic, and her son, young boy, broke his arm, broke his wrist, and began to swell up and much pain. Of course, him being non-charismatic and knowing nothing but medicine, obviously you have to set it and put it in a cast and all that. And she said, I'm going to pray and God will heal it. Well, to make a long story short, he said, I give you until in the morning for the manifestation. And she said, Brother Freeman, I got on my knees and said, Father, you say in your word that you'll bless the fruit of my womb, and that boy is the fruit of my womb, and I believe he's healed in Jesus' name, and I decree it. I decree that all the pain goes, is manifested when he gets up in the morning. He went to bed with it swollen badly and in pain and woke up the next morning totally manifested. Well, the significance is faith refuses to live with a no. Faith does. Faith refuses to take a no for an answer because it knows it isn't the answer. Faith will not live with a substitute or a no because that isn't faith. And the reason that faith will not take a substitute or a no as the answer is because God doesn't follow man's teaching. God keeps his word. If God followed man's teaching, then we'd have some problems, wouldn't we? But he doesn't follow what you hear for the most part about prayer and faith. He keeps his word. He is faithful to perform it. Praise God, I go everywhere telling them, they can charge me on the day we face the Lord with going around telling people God is faithful. God's word is true and God is true to his word. I said, you can charge me with that. If you want to charge me with something, tell it like I said. I'm willing to test it. I have. I've put it on the line time and again. Whether it's your life or your finances or whatever. Lack of insurance because you have assurance. I've had three cars wrecked three times, expensive cars, to see if I really had any concern about the finances, and won a brand new car, practically demolished, and the fellow had no insurance or assurance or faith or anything else. <laughs> so we paid it. And praise God for the privilege, in spite of the fact he lied and Gave us a Sears insurance policy number and all that, and they never heard of him. And you know, we go through the trials that some of you think you're going through by yourself. Yeah. Oh, yes. We just don't talk about them. Yeah. Except maybe to minister to you, to help your faith, to let you know that the reason we have such a strong faith is because we know it works. But I'll tell you, friends, it works. God is faithful. The devil cannot put, or if God allows it, like Job, keep anything on you that will destroy you. 
Impossible. Romans 8, 28 is still in the Bible. That even if you're going through a trial, it's working for your good. And to rejoice. And I found myself rejoicing in the midst of a test. Like he says to do in James 1 and Matthew chapter 5. And so when we know what he has said in his word about a thing, when he's made us a promise, we don't have to listen to what man has said. God doesn't listen to what man has said. God does what he has said. And that's what I'm going to stay with the word. He says, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe you have them. Believe you have received them and you shall have them. A fellow once said to me, called me long distance. Someone who reads Greek says, in the best manuscripts, it doesn't say have received. It just says received. You know, I generally quote it, what things wherever you desire. When you pray, believe you have received them and you shall have them. Believe it's already done. You have it. He says the best manuscripts don't have the word have in it. I said, doesn't matter. What does it matter? Leave have out. It says the same thing. When you pray, believe you receive, and you shall have it. What do you have to have have in there for? <laughs> Praise God. He said, that's right. It means the same, doesn't it? Hung up. Praise God. <laughs> About to let the devil talk him out through some man, you see. God doesn't listen to men. God listens to his own word. And when he hears you quoting his word after him, that'll change things. Things will change for the better in your life when you rid your head of all those foolish notions about prayer that men have taught you. You know why God will never say no to you when you meet the conditions? Oh, sure, you're ahead of me, some of you. 2 Corinthians 1.20. Here's why he can't say no. For all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. That's why he can't say no. We're living in the last hour. The hour has arrived when you have to choose between what men are saying and what God has already said. That doesn't change. If you can read, dear friends, God just pulled the rug out from under you. If you have any notion that he ever says no to a prayer that meets the conditions because the promises are already yes. 2 Corinthians 1.20 in Christ Jesus. Yes and amen, God says. So the erroneous notion that God always answers prayer has to be forsaken because there are just times when I haven't received an answer. And praise God, I didn't say, oh, isn't that wonderful? God knows best. He said no. Or look at this substitute. I've had people offer me substitutes. I said, I can't take it. It wouldn't be faith. That I'd never know when God is answering me. My first Cadillac many years ago I ordered, and don't stumble over that if you're new, or God will have to give you one like he did one brother who stumbled, and that cured him. But the brother said, he's a charismatic brother, a dealer, he sold Chrysler's, but he leases Cadillacs, and at the time I just wanted to lease a car. He said, I can save you about $1,000 on a Chrysler, big LeBaron. I said, but it didn't claim a Chrysler. I've not only claimed, but everywhere I've gone, I've confessed a Cadillac. Well, he said, it'll have to be a Cadillac, won't it? I said, yes, it won't work the other way. See, God isn't giving substitutes. Save a thousand, I could have saved a thousand dollars. I'll tell you, you'll save a thousand dollars and lose your faith. Because you'll start rationalizing in time of a physical trial or something of that nature. Well, after all, I've been telling God how to do it. Maybe surgery or this numerical drug's the way. And you start substituting man's way for God's way. Now, of course, I assume everybody here knows that that isn't God's way. Amen. Mutilation, he doesn't heal by mutilation, but restoration. Amen. The only remedy that he uses or needs is the blood of Jesus. Amen. No, God doesn't say no. Thank God he doesn't say no. He has refused me sometimes because it didn't meet the conditions. And then I'm challenged to find out why. Where did I miss it? Generally, I know where I missed it right away. Do you? Well, you should. I generally do. Half the time, I just didn't believe it. I didn't believe it enough to really get down to business with God. It wasn't an important thing. You know, sometimes I've rebuked the snow, and it just keeps on snowing. But sometimes when I've rebuked it, it stops. There's a difference, and I know when the difference is in my own heart. Yeah. Hallelujah.
That's just an example that some of you may be familiar with in your own life. Don't say, oh, he said no, he knows best, he wants to test everybody's faith to see if they can get to church by faith. <laughs> and he said, no, no, you just missed it somewhere. And we have seen God answer the prayer to control the weather when we meant business with God. Amen. Amen. Oh, yes, praise God. You could give some testimonies, but they wouldn't edify about missing God. But thank God if your eyes are open that he doesn't say no or send substitutes, that you missed it. Yeah. God doesn't change his word to conform to man's theology. Now another error concerning prayer, which we must give up if we expect to be able to pray prayers, learn to pray prayers that God's going to answer, is the notion that after we've tried everything else, when everything else fails, man, wisdom, money, doctors, after you've tried everything else, try prayer. And this is the notion that prayer is the panacea for all of our needs, all of our problems. Prayer is the panacea for everything. Now here I'm going to get closer to home to most of you than the other error. This is the one that's down rooted deep in your hearts. Most of you, if not all of you, so deep that if you don't hear what we're saying, you'll miss what God's saying. Prayer is not the answer for everything. That's not the route that is for everything. But prayer is said to be the panacea for everything. You'll see it on billboards. Families who pray together, stay together. Try prayer. Have you tried prayer today? If the doctors can't heal you, pray. If you're going bankrupt, pray. If your church is dry or dead, pray. If someone is planning a religious meeting, a crusade in your town, pray. Uh oh that was quieter. I didn't hear as many... <laughs> Oh, yeah, you see, right away we're into the emotional realm. Well, you know, a gospel crusade, we ought to pray. If your marriage is on the rocks, pray. If your children are on drugs, pray. If you've got problems at work, pray. Now, we're not demeaning prayer. Prayer has its place. But you see, institutional religion has taught us to substitute praying for obeying. Substituting prayer for changing our ways. Substitute prayer for acting on the Word of God by faith. You cannot substitute praying for obeying. You've got problems in your marriage, prayer is not the answer. Prayer has its place, I didn't say that. You've got problems in your marriage, mere prayer is not the answer. But changing or correcting whatever's causing the problems is the answer. I don't know why people think God's just going to erase all the problems we cause by selfishness and pride and indifference and just plain old laziness that result in problems in a marriage. Oh, God, help me. I want to do what's right. I want to please him, her. The answer is not prayer. Prayer is presented as a panacea for everything. Now, God doesn't say that in his word. Man teaches that. I don't like that word cop-out, but that's what it is. If your church needs more life, needs a little bit of life in it, pray for revival. But it never happens. What maybe they need to do is change their message or change that old dead denominational program for a baptism of power from on high. Churches are praying for revival when they ought to be praying for the Holy Spirit because revival is in the Holy Spirit. So if you're sick, instead of running to the doctor in the drugstore as you pray, you know, everybody believes in prayer, pray as you go into the operating room. Instead of running to the doctor and drugstore as you pray, why don't you put God first and last and only and you just may find out you don't need the doctor and the drugs. And if there's a religious meeting planned, advertised in newspaper or over the radio or television coming to town or the area, the first thing, everybody, I'll say 95% of the people, let's pray. They'll send requests up here to the pulpit. Pray for so-and-so's crusade over in Brazil or somewhere without first finding out whether or not they've even got the gospel. Now, friends, we have to tell you the way it is. Because 
You think that prayer is a panacea for everything, and it is not. Why, if they're preaching John 3.16 and opposing Acts 2, what are you praying for? For them to go forth and oppose and resist the truth of what God's doing today? If you insist on praying, and I'm not demeaning prayers, I say, if you insist on praying, then pray that God will open their eyes, or they'll open their own eyes to the full gospel and preach the whole counsel of God. We have this pious, emotional idea that it's because it's religious and, well, he does preach the salvation message or whatever that we ought to pray, pray, pray simply because there's a meeting. Why don't you pray a little more deeply than they're preaching? Pray God will open their eyes to the full gospel. God will deliver them from their opposition to the charismatic move. God never sent anybody forth to preach John 3.16 and oppose Acts 2. Where do you ever find that in the Word? And you see, you're not pleasing God to pray for somebody just to bless that meeting, Lord. Bless what? What part of it you want them to bless? And so prayer is not the panacea for everything. Prayer many times is just a devious way of getting out of facing reality. It's just a devious way of avoiding meeting our responsibilities, changing our ways, obeying God. Prayer has its place. Prayer can be a source of blessing and power. We know that. But that's for obedient Christians who pray the prayer of faith. God just flatly refuses people who pray to excuse their own misconduct, sin, doubt, and unbelief. I've got a passage for you over in Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. That it isn't God can't hear your prayers. He just plain isn't going to answer you. Unless you use prayer as a means of obeying God and not disobedience. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. If we pray according to his will, and if you're not living according to his will, you can't. But if we do pray according to his will, then he hears us. God in Isaiah said, I don't hear you if you're not living in accordance to my will. We cannot use prayer as a means of excusing our own lack of obedience or faith, is what we're saying. There are people, and maybe you've been guilty of it, who will actually lie awake all night praying for God to do something for them with much tears, crying out to the Lord, pleading with God, trying to get Him to come over to their side and give them their own way without any thought of whether or not that's the will of God or whether or not their life is pleasing to God. You see, if God did that, then you would be asking God to answer your prayer contrary to his own will. And he says he won't do that. 1 John 3, 21, 22, you've got to keep his commandments. You've got to do those things pleasing to him if you want God to answer your prayer. Like the woman that I dealt with once who prayed all week, fasted and prayed for over a week for God to show her whether or not he wanted her to do what she already knew that was contrary to his word. And when he didn't answer, came to me and wanted to know if it was all right to do what she already knew was contrary to the Word of God. The Word of God forbade it. I said, you don't even have to ask me. You sat under this ministry for over three years. You don't have to ask me that question. I don't know where we get these ideas about prayer, that we can use prayer to try to persuade God to come over to our side and give us our own way, when it's not His will, when it's contrary to the way He establishes the terms, like obedience and so on. Well, you can't substitute praying for obeying, is what we're saying. Prayer is not the panacea for all of your needs or problems or ills. Amen. Prayer is absolutely worthless unless it's made according to the will of God. No, if everything fails, you've tried everything else. Don't try prayer. Pray first, after you've met the conditions. Now, another error concerning prayer we want to take up tonight is like the others we've mentioned based upon bad theology picked up in institutional Christianity. And that is the reason we're told we cannot pray a definite prayer of faith. You know, Mark eleven twenty four. you're supposed to believe you have received when you pray. 
The reason we can't pray a prayer of faith like that about everything every time and why we must always condition our prayers, if it be thy will, do what you've said is your will, is because God many times would be kept busy changing his eternal plans. You see, this interferes with the sovereignty of God. He's got an eternal plan and purpose. Well, that's true. He does have an eternal plan and purpose. He's ordained, foreordained, predestinated everything that has and will come to pass. Get our tapes from the charismatic teaching sessions on predestination, biblical theology. You'll see there, if the Bible teaches one thing, it does teach that God has an eternal plan, and there's nothing that will ever happen that's not already included in that plan. Now, it's too involved to try to get into in this message, but there is a permissive will of God and decretive will. God decrees things that come to pass, and he permits other things. But whatever, whether it's permitted or already decreed by God, like the crucifixion of Jesus was decreed from the foundation of the world, Acts 2, Acts 4 tells us this, whether it's that or just permitted by God, nevertheless, everything's included in the eternal plan of God. So we're told... Since it's already included, then how can your prayers of faith be so absolute? God knows what his will is. You don't, we're told. You pray those strong prayers of faith, it may be contrary to his plan. And God certainly cannot or will not change his plan. That's kind of the idea these false apostles had when they rushed in here one night and tried to prophesy against the teaching of household salvation. Well, it'd be sufficient to say Acts 16.31 teaches it be sufficient to say that Matthew 18, 19 says two can agree together for anything in faith they believe for on the earth and will be done for them by their Father in heaven. It would be sufficient to say we've seen it happen again and again. Those we've claimed have been and are getting saved. I mean, what are you going to do with the facts? Someone wanted a proof text once for it before I gave them the proof text that I just gave you, Acts 16, 31, so on. He said, how can you believe somebody else? Well, I said, first of all, let's face the fact it's happening. All over. It's happening. So if it's happening, then since I can't save anybody, God must be doing it. <laughs> well, how are you going to believe somebody? Can you give me a text? I said, the Bible's full of them. How about Matthew 8, where the centurion believed for the healing of his servant? Amen. Jesus said it was according to his faith that his servant was healed. How about the Syrophoenician woman who believed for her daughter's deliverance? And how about Acts 16.31? You know, most people don't bother to hear all you're saying. I was working on a message today the Lord was giving me, and in that the Lord was showing me how there are a lot of people who just hear what they want to hear, believe what they want to believe. It's convenient. And so if people would bother to hear all you're saying, they might find out, they wouldn't make such fools out of themselves to contradict what the Word of God has said, which is what you're saying. But they can't see it because they can't put it together. They're not grounded in the Word. But let's get back to, does God change His plans? That's what they said. Oh, God's sovereign, and you can't claim someone's salvation. Well, let's get straight first of all. We don't save them, and our prayer of faith doesn't save them. Our prayer of faith gives God that substance, Hebrews 11.1. Gives him that substance to work with to begin to work in their lives, circumstances of their lives, where they come to the place they receive Christ. I claim my mother's salvation. When God saved her, she made the confession. She did the believing. See, nobody can do that for them. But she'd still be lost if I hadn't claimed her. So if it was just one soul saved, it'd be worth taking Acts 16, 31, that it's worth... But back to the question, would it change God's plans? No, God doesn't have to change his eternal plans and purposes when we pray the prayer of faith. And I'll tell you why. It's because he has already, before all the foundation of the world, he has already included in his eternal plan every prayer of faith that his children will answer, all the circumstances involving it, the answers to it. The promises God gave, as well as the prayer of faith we make concerning them, as well as the answers to them, as well as all the circumstances have been foreordained from the foundation of the world. They've been included in his plans. Now, we don't know all of that, you see. We just have to do what he said. What things soever you desire when you pray, believe you receive it and you'll have it. Now, he couldn't say that. All things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. He couldn't say that if he hadn't already included whatever we could ask in line with his will, if he had already included that in his plan. You're not going to do anything contrary to the will of God. 
even when they disobeyed God, he'd already included that in his plan. Amen. That's his permissive will, as we said. Now some of you, I can tell, need to get the tapes and listen. You ought to yourself to at least listen to them once. The deeper teaching out of the Word of God on predestination, God's eternal plan, the decrees of God. Because there you will see God has foreordained everything that comes to pass from the fall of a sparrow to the rise of a nation. He says in Matthew 10, 29, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and not one of them shall fall to the ground without your father? A little old sparrow, you say. It can't even fall to the ground except he's ordained when and how. And then in Daniel 4, 17, The Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Everything from the fall of a sparrow to the rise of a nation has been predestinated by God. God does not have to change his plans to answer our prayers of faith. He's included them in his eternal plan. Why? Acts 15, 18. Known unto God are all of his works from the foundation of the world. You're not going to take God by surprise. The answers have already been known unto God from the foundation of the world. The prayers you make that will get those answers have already been known to God from the foundation of the world. God isn't going to have to change anything because he has already included whatever you pray by faith in his plans. And one of the evidences that he's already included, already that he doesn't have to change his plans, is seen in those times, and it happens not infrequently, when answers come from such faraway places in such ways that we discover the day we get the answer manifested, it was on the way long before we prayed. <laughs> Praise God. I like to laugh at people's expressions sometimes. <laughs> because they won't let God be God. And when you start telling them who God is, it just about boggles their mind and their eyes short. <laughs> God can do this, answer you before you ask, because he says in his word, he works that way many times. He says in Isaiah 65, 24, it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. Praise God. Let God be God. Let the Holy Spirit teach you something besides what man has said. And he'll rid you of all of those ridiculous notions that God has to do what man says. He doesn't have to do anything except what he says. And he has to do that because he says, I regard my word above my name. He said that. Now, why can God answer your prayer before you ask it? Because he can anticipate your prayers. He did that from eternity. He knows just when that needs to be manifested. And because he works from both ends of the line at the same time, he's controlling circumstances. Isaiah 10, he controlled Assyria's punishment of Israel. He said, Assyria is the rod of mine anger in my hand to punish my people Israel. God can do it because of Acts 15, 18. The answers are predestinated just like the prayers are. A good example of this is the woman some time ago who planned her will. Of course, if you're planning on dying, I guess it's good to have a will. Planned her will three years before she died. Included in that will, now listen carefully to me and you'll see how God answers before you ask. I've experienced it. This woman included in her will a friend for $500 in her will, three years before she died. She proceeded to die. <laughs> the lawyer was locating the people to give the things that were left to them. He couldn't find this woman. After searching around, he discovered she was in California. He wrote to that address. She had since moved, gone to Oregon, wrote to that address. Wanted to send her the 500. She had since moved and didn't know where she was. Now all of this is taking several months after the three years. And then he learns that she's in Ohio. He checks this, and this is her address now. He located her, sent her the letter and the check for 500. She gets it, you know, in two or three days and writes him right back and says, this is a miracle. She said, 
The day after I claimed this 500, the exact amount, by the way, she said, your letter came with a check in it. She said, I desperately needed 500. It was a case of like losing the house or something. It wasn't like she could wait two days. It had to be the next day. Next day. Absolutely next day. No exceptions. Said, last night, there's no way possible to get that money, so I just committed to the Lord, believe I have it. And she said, the next day, here it comes in the mail. Now, do you see what God's done? Three years before the prayer of faith, over three years, closer to four before the prayer of faith is ever offered, he moves on a woman's heart to include in her will 500 for somebody that about four years later is going to pray a prayer of faith about. And then he keeps her address, the beneficiary, her address hidden from the lawyer for many months because she hasn't prayed the prayer of faith yet. And then he so controls the circumstances, the writing of the letter, the writing of the check, the mail delivery. Like tomorrow there won't be any, so the prayer of faith would have to fit in just right. <laughs> He's so controlling all of those circumstances that he actually has the lawyer write it, get it in the mail so that it'll be delivered on the exact day she needs it, the exact precise day. Almost four years before she prayed the prayer of faith, God said, before she called, I heard her. <laughs> already included. That proves it's already included in his eternal plan. He doesn't have to change anything. People may change. God doesn't change. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let the skeptics and the doubters be in misery if they want to. I'm going to say with the word of God, Isaiah 65, 24, it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they're yet speaking, I will hear. No, it wasn't coincidence. It was predestination. It wasn't coincidence when I got the 10,000 the day after I prayed for it. And it came in a way that it had to be in the mail when I prayed. It wasn't a coincidence. I didn't think of it as a coincidence. I just said, praise God. Praise God for Isaiah. I knew that was in Isaiah. Because Isaiah 65, 24 says that God includes both the asking and the answer. God has to be God, and to be God, he's going to do it his way. Isaiah 65, 24 proves that God has foreseen both the need and the answer to the need, that he controls the circumstances. It proves that prayer does not interfere with his will, but that the prayer of faith is an important part of his eternal plan. If you don't offer the prayer of faith, you see, it wouldn't work. You're not going to get it anyway because it's in his plan. You see, the prayer of faith, the prayer of faith is included in his eternal plan and purpose. Without the prayer of faith being offered, all of God's complex working in this situation would be to no avail because, you see, the woman, he had to work in her life three or four years before she died to include a woman, keep the address hidden until the woman was going to pray the prayer of faith, control the males, all the circumstances, writing the letter. We well, see, that lawyer might have been busy that day when he was going to intend to write the letter. He's been searching for months, so he could say, what's the hurry? He didn't even have to be a believer to fulfill God's will there. This is the reason why a prayer of doubt is so displeasing to God because it hinders, interferes with his plans. See, the prayer of faith is intended for your life. Now, I'm not talking here about any contradiction where it would change anything. But see, a prayer of doubt can't be included as something he wants for you. This is why without faith it's impossible to please God. This is why so many people don't get a blessing. Now, from our side, it's going to sound a little hard for some people to accept. From our side, it's our fault. But the reason you don't get blessings, you weren't included in God's plan for the blessings. I didn't expect an amen. I didn't get a single one. Maybe all of you need to hear the tapes again on predestination. From our side, it's our responsibility. God included your prayers of faith because he foresaw you making them. See, he can't make those for you. That's not the same as election and calling and salvation. He didn't foresee anything you would do in that. It's grace and not works. 
But God didn't include some of you in the blessings because you don't believe for the blessings. You don't meet the conditions. There's no way you to know whether or not you're included. No way you to know whether God's going to bless you. But nothing can change the eternal plan and purpose of God. Now to turn it around, God does not have to change his plans because he's already included what you're going to do in his plans. You're responsible, but God is sovereign. God despises a prayer of doubt because if he had included it as a part of his will for you, it would have just hindered his plans. And so he just includes you out. He doesn't say no or send a substitute. He just plain doesn't answer you because you weren't a beneficiary to that part of his will. Well, a little sobering, and you don't get shouted down with amens, but I'll tell you one thing. It might make some of us a little more careful how we pray because we do have the assurance that if we pray according to his will, that was included in his eternal plan. See, so we've come full circle. Nobody's been left out. But I'm not even going to sympathize with you if you don't get answers to your prayers. I'm just going to be very firm with you and tell you it's because you aren't included in God's great plan to get an answer. And the reason is your fault, not his. If he decreed you pray the prayer of faith as a decree, his decretive will, you'd have to pray it. But that isn't faith. That isn't freedom. So he permits you to make the choice. Am I going to believe when I pray or not? And if you don't, he hasn't included it. That's why you don't get an answer. Because if he had, you'd get it in spite of your unbelief. From our side, it's our fault. We weren't back there then. We don't have to worry about what he put in his plan. All we have to be concerned about is, am I going to obey God from this point on? Now, I've heard him say it, that I wasn't included. All those times I didn't get an answer, I wasn't included to get a blessing. Because you had been, you couldn't help but get it. God can make it rain on anybody he wants, the unjust as well as the just, he says. So he could heal you in spite of your unbelief. He could get you out of debt in spite of the fact that you would rather trust the finance company. Or whatever. But he doesn't do that. And the reason he doesn't is because you won't believe it. He hasn't included you to get the blessing. Well, let's come to another reason why we've got to get rid of all of this bad theology that we've been taught. Another thing we're told is that if we pray that prayer of faith, expecting to receive when we pray, and do not pray if it be God's will, then we'd be contradicting what the Bible itself teaches about other people who prayed, if it be thy will, not my will be done. And especially, we dealt with some of these last time, but especially James 4 where it says, we ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live or do this or that. We should not say, we're told, with a strong statement of faith. Thus and so is going to come to pass. I believe I have it. Let's turn over to James 4 and we'll see a little more what we're talking about. Last time, you recall, we dealt with the argument sometimes used that Jesus prayed three times in the garden, not my will but thine be done. So we pointed out then he wasn't teaching us how to pray the prayer of faith. He was struggling with his own going to the cross shortly. He teaches us how to pray the prayer of faith in other passages. Matthew 21, 22, Mark 11, 24. And we pointed out that he himself says in Matthew 6, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do. But here they think they have an unanswerable. Verse 13, go to now, good old King James expression, go to now ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live, or do this or that. And so we're told, you see, this plainly tells us in James chapter 4 that we are to pray, not with that bold, presumptuous, brazen attitude I believe I have received 
but if it be God's will. Really sounds pious. See, the only problem is, James isn't talking about praying, he's talking about saying. Amen. And there's all the difference in the world. James is not teaching you how to pray the prayer of faith in chapter 4. He does that in chapter 1. And there he said, pray in faith, nothing doubting. For if you doubt, you'll receive nothing from God. There's where he teaches about prayer, and there he says, pray in faith. In fact, in chapter 5, he teaches about prayer, and he says, the prayer of faith will heal the sick. He didn't say, pray if it be thy will. He's not talking about praying, he's talking about saying. We ought not to say. He's talking about carnal Christians who never submit their will to God in whatever they're going to do. God is not in their plans and purposes. We've got churches filled with people. He's reprimanding those. He's saying you shouldn't say, well, I'm going to do this or that and stay in this town for a year and do this and do that. You ought to say, if God wills, I will do that. He's not talking about how to pray about a promise of God where you know His will and God expects you to claim it. It's this attitude that you hear from Christians. I am always hearing them say what they're going to do. And they never seem to consider God in their plans. Someone asked me recently, are you going to Florida this year? I said, Lord willing, I will. Said that to an unbeliever, but that's the way I had to say it. As far as I know, I will. I'll go get a little of that sun before the winter's over, but <laughs> there's no way in the world at this stage that I know I'm going, so if the Lord will. But that's rather a trifle. What he's talking about here is go to another city and buy and sell and get gain and stay there a year and get in business and marry a wife and make all those decisions without considering God. So you can't use James 4, I'm sorry. He's not talking about praying, but saying. If you want to know what he says about prayer, read chapter 1 and chapter 5. There'd be no doubt. Pray in faith, nothing doubting, or you'll get nothing from God. Couldn't be any plainer. Why then do Christians insist on conditioning their prayers with the weakest and most negative term in the human language, if? It's because that's all they've ever read or heard. It's because it's easier for them to do that than to meet the responsibility. They're saying, God, you're going to do what you want anyway, regardless of what I want. So if you're going to do what you want anyway, if you're going to give it to me, give it to me. If you're not going to answer, don't answer. So I'll just sign off with that pious, not my will with thine be done, if it be thy will. Bible says God doesn't even hear that. He said, when you pray, believe you have received. He rebuked his disciples when they wouldn't believe. Why couldn't we cast out the demon, they said? Because of your unbelief. He expected it. Peter sank after he walked on the water. Why? Because he doubted and Jesus told him why. He said, oh, thou of little faith, why did you doubt? Walking on the water. How many want to raise their hand? They'd like to try it after the lake thaws. before you criticize Peter and yet he rebuked him because his little faith wouldn't hold him up now if he only took one step he could have walked ten miles on water if he ever got a step on the water by faith but doubt killed it God is displeased with your doubt so James isn't talking about praying he's talking about saying that carnal attitude so many Christians have, I'm going to buy this house or this business or go here and preach or do this or that. You better find out if it's God's will. Amen. Don't condition your prayers with that weak, innocuous term, if. Did you ever hear a pastor or deacon pray before an offering, if? Oh, Lord, if it's your will, give us an offering. No, they're very positive. The same ones, <laughs> same ones that come right behind the offering and then teach a sermon on prayer, if, as if that's pious. They never pray if about an offering. They don't say if. Oh, I've never heard if. Lord, we thank you for the offering we're about to receive. If you've ever been to church, you've heard that. You hear it every Sunday. We thank you for the offering we're about to receive and we're going to use it for the kingdom and for your glory. They already have it spent. 
they're so positive they'll get an offering. If they didn't believe they would, they wouldn't pass a plate even though there's nothing in the Bible that promises anything about passing plates. <laughs> Not a word in the Bible says God will bless passing plates. The reason they're not really blessed financially is because they pass plates, but that's another story. Did you ever sit down at the table and pray, if it be thy will, give me this day my daily bread? Every person in here go sit at the table expecting the bread to be there. And how many times do you go to the table, children or husbands, and there's nothing on the table? She says, go sit down, it's in the oven. Go sit down, I'll bring it. Go ahead and pray, thank God. We bow our heads and thank God for what we don't even see. No one ever thinks of saying, if it be your will, let there be some food over there in the oven. <laughs> oh, how ridiculous man has become. I mean, you know, it's expected of the unregenerate, but Christians and charismatics ought to expect prayer to change things. The prayer of faith will change things, but the prayer that's conditioned with an if will change nothing. But your own condition for the worse. Pay the cost to get into the Word of God. God has revealed in His Word what His will is. Pay the price to get in His Word. Do that before you pray so that when you pray you can leave that if off. That displeases God. Praying if it be thy will about the clear promises of God is like the man out in the middle of a lake in a rowboat with one oar. You just go around in circles. Never get to your destination. You want to get there, you want the answer, but when you put the if on it, you can't get there. God wants you to know that there is a place in his heart that is special for those who will lay aside everything and allow him to minister them this end time deeper word in such a way that their lives become transformed, changed by the word, just the word, not what they feel or see, but just the word. There's a special place in his heart for those people. They're going to have special rewards and special blessings, perhaps even special crowns because through all eternity God's going to have a group of people that he'll point to all through eternity, which never ends, and say, those are the people that believe me. Those are the religious fanatics that went to the glory barn. <laughs> those are those faith assembly nuts that everybody talked about and against. And the devil spent 24 hours a day trying to defeat their faith. Those are the people that have a special place in my heart, God will say. Amen. And that's by the Spirit. It's also by the Word because it's in His Word. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You can get saved. You can talk in tongues. You can occasionally get a prayer answered. God isn't giving you the end time message of faith to try to show you how to get answers to prayer as an end in itself or to get your bills paid or your body healed to the point you can walk in health. Those things will just happen if you believe his word. Those are not ends. Those are just the blessings along the way to get you to the end he's trying to bring you. Because in the end time, mark it down somewhere, God has a ministry for his body. But he can only use that part of it that's willing to sit and say, well, I don't see anything happening much in my life, my little spot, my little chair, my little corner. I'm just going to hold out because my spirit tells me to hold on to what he's been saying all these years, that there's a great end time army being prepared. God's going to use it. It's a Gideon's army. It isn't 33,000, 32,000. It's only 300. Well, you say there's more than 300 here. Well, there's more than what's here. Other places who believe the word of God like we believe it. So it isn't a literal 300, but it's a very small band. He's going to use, and he's going to say, these are the ones that believe me all the way. They were willing to be foolish. They learned how to pray the prayer of faith, not just in words, but their lives matched what they prayed, what they said they believed. Amen. Stand with us, if you will. Father, it's in the name of Jesus we commit this meeting together to you and ask that you would direct it 
in such a way that all of our lives will fulfill in exact conformity to your plan, your will. And not be a one of us that will take lightly whether we're boy, girl, man or woman, young or old, male or female, will not take lightly the words that you're giving us in this end time. Father, we pray that you'll impress upon each heart that this is your word and their only opportunity to do something about it. Impress them with the urgency of the hour. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Let the Spirit of God anoint that word to your heart. Whatever you have need of, remember those blessings come by the prayer of faith. You can reach out right now and claim it. Salvation, baptism of the Holy Spirit, healing. Your financial needs to be met. Household salvation. Acts 16.31 Claim your loved ones. You'll regret it for all eternity if you don't bring them into the ark by faith. I don't read anywhere where Noah's family believed or disbelieved. It said Noah believed. Amen. And he was able to save his whole family. Certainly it's implied they believed. But God doesn't bother to tell us that. He said Noah obeyed and saved his family. Whatever it is, reach out, believe God. Come for a healing touch. Let the blood of Jesus and the name of Jesus and the power of the risen Christ drive out of your body pain and sickness, unbelief. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Spirit of Praise God. Praise God. Praise God.